Hey, how fam? Welcome to our YouTube channel. Give us a thumbs up and subscribe so you can get new content each week. We pray that you enjoy this message on today. Uh, grab your Bibles and let's go to John chapter 4. And I want you to stand. And I want you to stand for the reading of the word on today. We're going to read just a few short passages. John chapter 4, we're going to read verses 21 to 24. Lady kind of greased the wheels there and got things going with this passage uh, in worship today. Um, I want to read from the NIV, the New International Version. And here's what the word of the Lord says. It says, woman, Jesus replied. Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is of the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, in the spirit, and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers. I want y'all to hear that. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. For a short time today, I want to talk to you from the topic, the place called now. The place called now. You can have your seats in the presence of the Lord if you're going to help me. If you're not going to help me, just remain standing, and your stand is going to help me. <laughs> Y'all, I want to jump into a new series um, entitled, We Outside. <laughs> we Outside. How many of y'all ever heard that phrase before? Somebody say, we, out, we Outside. We, we Outside. We Outside. <laughs> outside. What that phrase literally means is that we are making moves. What it means is that uh, uh, we are one that are ones that are refusing to just sit on the seat of do nothing, but we're up, we're ready, and we're out and ready to make some changes. Oh, Lord. I can already tell some this this is going to be some work. Help me, Holy Ghost, because these folks in here are not. But one that makes moves, moves that reflect his glory. Moves that reflect not just who you are, but whose you are. These are moves that reflect not just who you are, but whose you are. Now, if I can tell you something about God about our father is that he loves to give give gifts he loves to share he loves to share and 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 lavish his love on his people Uh, he is a father that love and from the beginning of time he's always shared with his people he shared his garden he shared his promises. He shared his provision. He shares his peace. He shares his purposes and plans. He shares his love, his protection. He shares his mercy, his grace, and he even shares his name. He's a God that shares. But if I can't suggest to you that I found that there is one thing that he refuses to share. Y'all want to know what that is? He refuses to share his glory. He refuses to share his glory. That is one area he will absolutely 
absolutely never share as a worshiper of Yahweh, as a worshiper of God, as one who gives God, who lays down their lives, who surrenders now, who gives him everything. One thing he refuses to do is share his glory. And so what that means is that the worshiper can never be described as one uh, that, 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 that receives glory or that takes glory or that misplaces glory. Uh, uh, worship can never, it, it is an accurate, it is an inaccurate or incomplete definition if, if you subject uh, worship to a definition that doesn't include glory. Why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because, because the reality is oftentimes people of God, we get so caught up in these moments and these places and these spaces that we forget that true worship is not worship that just happens inside of these walls. But worship uh, is, is, is something that happens outside of these walls. Worship is something that, 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 that this, is, this is a response. This is a result. What happens in here is a result of the life that we're living outside of the walls. We can summate our worship to what happens in a two-hour time period on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. It's so much more than that. Our problem is, our problem is we, 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 we have these, these critical and these wonderful moments. We cry in the presence of God. We, we rest in the comfort of God in his presence in here. And we just say, oh, we just had a wonderful time. And then we leave here and we outside live in any kind of way. We outside and it's no sign upon thine hands and there's no frontlet between the, your eyes. We outside, we come in here and we worship and then outside of these four walls, our kids see us live a different way. And then we wonder why we can't get our kids on the right track. We wonder why our kids won't listen to what we say. No, they're doing what you do. They're doing what you've done. And one thing that I can tell you is that I've always paid attention to the life that I've modeled before my children. Here's why. Because lady was just saying, she was talking, I'm telling you, she was in the spirit and she was talking about, talk, talking to the kids and sharing with them that this moment is important for you as well. And that parents, if you understood the significance of these moments, you will also have your mouths open. You will also have those kids gathered together. Because the, because, because, because the enemy, enemy is after your children. Let me tell you why. Because God accomplishes and fulfills his kingdom will and purpose through generations. And so that there are things that you start that you're going to finish. But then there are other things that you start that your kids are called to finish. However, if, you're, if, you're in, if the enemy can get your kids before you, before you get your act together, before you fully understand what it means to be a worshiper, then guess what? He can kill the seed before it. I need y'all to understand something. The entire direction and flow of the history of Israel pivots on the aspect of worship. The entire direction and flow of Israel pivots on the, on the aspect of worship. If you think about it, if you go back and you look at it, Israel, uh, when things, uh, when things, uh, when they were placing glory where it belonged, when they were worshiping God the way they were called to, life was good. But it was when they engaged in improper worship that things began to collapse. If you, if you think about it, there's rarely or often never, or uh, just about never a time in Scripture that you'll see that things fell apart when Israel was in the temple worshiping. No, see, they, they lost it. Things began to collapse when they changed their decisions for what they were doing outside of the four walls. We focus so much on what happens inside, but Israel lost things based on what happened outside of the walls. 
I want y'all to think about that. I want y'all to think about that. They went through things that they went through because of the decisions that they made outside of the walls, not inside. They, they didn't bring Baal uh, inside of the temple. They worship Baal outside where those. Because it is the zeal of God that has a requirement that says glory must remain in me and to me. It, 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 it is in Exodus 20 and 3. I'm giving you all some scriptures and examples. Exodus 20 and 3 says this. You shall have no other gods before me. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is also an expression of order. See? This, is, this, is, this is also an expression of order. See? I need you all to understand something. Because worship is not just uh, who you choose to give honor and glory to. But worship is also even more so who you choose to give glory and honor to first. Who's in, who's in the seat? Who's in first place? Uh, 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 there was a scripture that says, uh, you've done all these wonderful things. You have wonderful church, wonderful conferences, and all of these things. But the one thing I have against you is that you left your, your first love. He says, I promise you, I'll give you everything you have a desire and need for if you would just seek me Why? Because he's, he has a requirement that he remains in first place in your life. Are y'all hearing me? He requires that he remains in first place in your life. Uh, because what you put first in your life consistently is an indication of what you worship. What you put first in first place in your life consistently, meaning over a period of time, indicates what you worship. If you constantly, if you constantly are chasing the bag, then that's what you're worshiping. If you're constantly looking for notoriety, then you are who you worship. If you can't say amen, just say ouch. Because whoever and whatever you put in first place is who you worship. Everybody is designed to worship. And everybody worships. Even the non-believer worships. Even the atheist worships. You're wired to worship. You can't help but worship. Worship is boiled down to your decisions. And not just your decisions inside of the sanctuary, but your decisions outside of the sanctuary. You can declare you're a worshiper all day, but if you don't lay your life down, if you don't give your life daily, if you don't die daily, as Paul said, you're not worshiping him with all your heart. And so I want to give you another one. Isaiah 48 and 9 to 11 tells us that even his furnace of affliction was for the purpose of refinement because he will not yield his glory to another. So what that means is even what you're going through is for the purpose of his glory because and he refuses to allow anyone else or anything else to bring you out because if he does, then he'll give you'll give the glory to that. Some of you are probably asking yourself, why am I going through what I'm going through for so long? The reason why is because you haven't made up in your mind that when you come out, you're going to give him the glory for it. You haven't made up in your mind that you're only surviving in it while being in it because he's getting the glory out of it. But it was Apostle Paul that says that, 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 that this, this, this thing that I'm going through is not, is, is not worthy of being compared to the glory that shall be revealed. In other words, he says, what I'm going through is not worth even measuring up because on the outside of it, on the end of it, on the other side of it, God is going to get the glory. And he says, and it'll all be worth it. 
it'll all be worth it. I promise you, if you will trust God with anything, including what you're going through, I'm letting you know at the end of the day, just like, just like Pastor told us last week, it'll all be worth it. Isaiah 49 and 3 says, he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. In other words, he said, you are mine, and by the time I'm done with you, everybody will know that you are mine. Uh, he says, uh, I, I want you to know that, that who, I want you to know not only who you are, but whose you are. I need you to understand something, that when I am done with you, people of God, he's saying, when I am finished with that work that I'm doing in your life, people will see me all over you. People will smell me all over you. People will look at you and say, it was nobody but God. That there's got to be a God. For you to go through what you're going through, you're going to look into my, the furnace of my life, into the fire of my life, and see that it wasn't just me, but there was another one walking around in the fire with me. When he says my splendor, he is referring to his glory. He's referring to his glory. Everyone should know who you belong to. You got to know, you got to know, you got to know. Psalm 106 and 8 tells us that he saved Israel for his name's sake. To make his power known. He said, I'm saving Israel for my name's sake that when I, so that when I come through, everybody will say that's the power of God. I want, to, I want to know Yahweh. I want to know Israel's God. Who is that God? I believe there was a moment in time where Israel was in a battle, and, and, and they were in the wrong place. Now, granted, that's a completely different story, but I want you to understand the reaction of the adversary. Uh, there was a time where Israel brought, brought the Ark of the Covenant out to battle in the heat of battle, in a moment when they were losing and their enemy uh, looked and said wait a minute where's all that praise and noise and glory coming from oh my god you see what they did Israel just brought their God out to the battlefield and they got nervous because when his power shows up it's going to shore up his name when his power shows up in your life, it's going to show up his name. When his power shows up in your everyday life, it's going to show up his name. Uh, 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 I believe it was my grandfather that even as I would leave the house, we, as we leave the house as kids, uh, he, we would go out and he'd say, boy, don't you shame my name. My grandfather was a bishop, and he knew that when I left the house, and even when I left the church, wherever I was, I was representing his name. I want to ask you, people of God, what name are you showing right now? He said, I refuse to let my name be embarrassed. I refuse. I, I knew that if I got out in these streets and acted a plum fool, that I was going to pay when I got back. I knew that I was going to owe some skin when I got back. I knew that it was going to cost me something when I got back. I'm here to let you know that God is a God that won't even let you go out there and won't even let you show off the way you're trying to show. Are you going to trip and fall? You're going to bust your tail. When you try to get out, get out and do stuff in your own strength. In fact, it was Uzzah that tried to catch the Ark of Covenant as it was falling. And what happened? The anger of the Lord was kindled against him and he killed him immediately. Uzzah, you will not show or even demonstrate that you can carry my glory with your own strength. It's going to require my power. And it's going to be because of my namesake. I got one more for you. Romans 9 and 17 says this. It says, for, for scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose. That I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Because where you place glory determines the direction of your worship. 
Why is he saying, why, why, do we, why do we go through all of these scriptures? Why did we go through all of these, uh, ex, these, 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 these five different scriptures? And, 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 and there are many more examples because where you place glory determines the direction of your worship. To many of you, you are placing glory elsewhere. You're placing God's glory elsewhere. But I'm here to let you know today that your workout and medication didn't heal you. I want you to know that your job didn't provide for you, that Joe didn't bail you out, that caffeine didn't keep you from being sleepy and running off the road on your way home, that your witty inventions and creativity didn't come to you just because you worked hard enough. You, you could have been a hot mess. You could have lost your mind, but God, I dare about 50 of y'all to give him a but God praise if you know that it wasn't anybody but God that brought you out, that was anybody but God that bailed you out, I want you to give him real glory. Red Bull didn't do it. I know I'm not the only one that can drink, drink a nice strong cup of coffee but yawn right on after it. God says there are literally angels that I'm going to encamp around about you so that regardless of what I know, go ahead, drink your little coffee, baby. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that's going to keep you. Uh, 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 maybe you will think that caffeine is going to keep you awake, but what's going to keep the other car from breaking? In the area of biblical worship, and the theology of God's glory, there is a principle called sacred journey. I want y'all to write that down. Sacred journey. God required that Israel be followers of him. He required. He didn't suggest it. He didn't say it would be nice to have. He required that Israel become followers of him. The expectation is that Yahweh would, would lead Israel to places where he intended to reveal himself. Y'all think about it. For, for example, uh, you know, when we, when we went mobile, uh, we, we, we used the phrase, we're following the cloud. It wasn't a churchy statement. What we're literally saying, we're going to places where we believe that when we get there, he's going to reveal himself to us. The cloud isn't just here, but the cloud will follow you home. The cloud will follow you to your job. It'll lead you to all of these places. But, but the expectation is that Yahweh would lead people, let me hurry up, would lead people, if Israel, to a place where he intended to reveal himself. Uh, there, there's a phrase that we see in scripture oftentimes called to seek. Seek. Seek ye first, right? Seek, seek, seek. Uh, to seek. Uh, what, what, that, 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 that phrase uh, is from a Hebrew word called derash. Put it up on the screen if, if you have it. That's how it's spelled right there. It's called derash. And what this, what this word literally means is to seek. However, the, the word has, uh, has, has multiple uh, uh, uses. It can be used in many, and it has been used in many different places in Scripture. However, any time uh, uh, the Lord, the name of the Lord followed that, that word or that phrase, derash, it is an indication of worship. So let's think about it. You can't just, this is, this is where we're shifting from. You can't just say, I want to study about worship and then look up a scripture, look up all the scriptures that contain the word worship. It will not give you all the instances and examples of worship in scripture. Because even this word, derash, which means to seek, is translated to worship when his name is after it. 
Let, let, let me give you an example. Jeremiah 29 and 13 says, you will seek for me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. He says, you will seek me and you will find me, Darash, worship, when you seek me, when you worship me with all your heart. Any place your heart is divided and not fully given over to God, that means you're not worshiping him with all your heart. Any place you're living, we're going somewhere, any place you're living and dwelling and operating and functioning in your life where you're saying that I'm going to reflect who God is in my life everywhere except here. Y'all know sometimes we get around people where we just, we're not going to talk about church. We know that's just not how they roll. So we, gonna, we, we keep quiet. Because, I mean, think, think about it. Let, let's, let's be honest. Let's be honest. There's some people that don't view your worship lifestyle as something that's popular and something that's good and something that's just like. And so I want to know how many of your close friends or even, even co-workers know your life. I remember growing up, because I, I, I wasn't all the way there, I, I know I probably weren't the only one, but there were times where I would be in church and, and I, as a kid, and one of my friends would show up at church that I didn't even know went to church. And I, I'd be like, because it wasn't cool. It, was, it, it, it wasn't cool. How many times, I mean, I want you to think about it, because there are times when people can even look at your social post and how church will tell on you because they caught you like this. And your, your co-worker friend like, that's, she go to church. We worship God in such compartmentalized ways to where we feel like we're worshiping him with all of our heart, but we confine him to one space. I need y'all to understand something. By the, time he's, and, and, and by the time he's finished with you, it doesn't matter where you are. You will tell the world. You want the world to know whose name you're carrying. In the Jewish culture, they had a thing called circumcision for men, for the men. Which meant that they had to wear who they belonged to permanently, indefinitely. And that it doesn't matter where they found themselves in the world and in life. If someone even saw or caught a glimpse of private parts, they'll know who they belong to. If you look at even Israel, uh, Jewish, uh, the, the culture, there was uh, the, the difference between Jewish and all, uh, 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 all, other, all other religions is that Jews were uh, what, what we call monotheists, just like ourselves. We, we worship one God. There's one God. Contrast to polytheism, which were many gods. There was a God of the sun, God of the moon, God of the rain, God of, the, God of this, God of that. And their, and their temples were just about anywhere. But Israel had one place where they all went to worship. Israel not only had one place, but their, their temple was turned in one direction. And because their temple was turned in that one direction, everybody knew who that belonged to. Ah, everybody knew whose it was. Everybody already knew how, by the way they carried themselves who they were. keep going so I need y'all to understand something 
that, 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 that the, the, the seeking God, the seeking of God leads to the revelation of God. The seeking of God leads to the revelation of God. When you seek him, you will find him. And it doesn't necessarily mean that he's not with you. It's just that it hasn't been revealed to you who's with you. But he's with you the, the entire time. He's not a God. He's not a man that he should lie. And he, when he says that he's never leaving you nor forsaking you, he's always with you. The reality is you just don't know it. The reality is it just hasn't been revealed to you. The truth of the matter is you just aren't aware of it yet. This is, this is, how, we, this is how we end up with even, even the, script, uh, the song that says, uh, let us become more aware of your presence. Because there's a, there's a possibility and the ability to be near him but not realize that he's near you. <laughs> because where you place, because seeking, uh, the seeking of God leads to the revelation of God. So when we look at this text, I want to quickly go to this text and then we're going to wrap up. Um, uh, when we go to this text, we'll find uh, that there is a place of worship being brought up by the Samaritan woman. And, and for those that aren't familiar with the story, uh, Jesus and his disciples are leaving and, and headed toward Galilee. They're leaving a place where they were uh, because they heard, uh, because, because uh, the Pharisees heard that baptism was taking place. And they thought it was Jesus, but it was really the disciples. Long story and we went, we're not going there. However, they were leaving, going to a place called Galilee and as they were leaving, the disciples said, we got to find Jesus' food. Jesus says, I need to go through Samaria. Jesus goes through Samaria and he gets to this well and he sits down and encounters a woman who's drawing water from the well. This is what Lady was talking about during her worship. He, uh, he finds her drawing water from the well and then he engages her in conversation. He asks her for a drink. I, 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 there's so much in, to unpack right there because I need you to talk, understand that we're talking about a holy God. We're talking about God made flesh. However, he's revealed, anytime God revealed his humanity, it was all to reveal his spirituality and, and, and who he really is as God the Son. So the scripture says that he was tired from his journey. Oh, you tired, huh? Uh, he says, he asked, the, the scripture says he asked the woman for a drink. So, so you're thirsty. But I thought you were the living water. I thought you were. You asked the woman for water and then you turn around and tell him, if you, tell her if you knew who I was. And I would give you living water. So, so he, he engages her in conversation. And as I was reading and studying this, I realized something that, that, that God was showing me that there are three types of worshipers. They're really, I, I, and, and this, is just, this is just Pastor DJ's take and, you know, you, you can have your own. But there are three types of worshipers. And that first one is a routine worshiper. It is the routine worshiper. It is the one that continues to do the same thing and follows the same routine over and over and over and over again, but seeing no change. She called it. But the reason why you keep doing it over and over again is because it's not satisfying. It only lasts for a moment. Because y'all know y'all had those moments where y'all got weak. 
and you decided to fall and, you know, you decided to do I mean, just, just this one time. And by the next morning, and, and most often immediately after, that whole reality, your eyes are open. Now you're like, I didn't need to do that. <laughs> Depending on how, let, let me leave that alone. <laughs> it is the routine worshiper. That is the first one. <laughs> Because nothing you place before God to satisfy your need will ever be enough. This is why he has to be first because when you look for him, he'll always satisfy every need. But when you decide to put something else in that first place, uh, it will never satisfy. It won't last. It's momentary. It doesn't matter what substance. It doesn't matter what someone. It doesn't matter what something. At the end of it all, only after a matter of minutes, hours, seconds, whatever it is, that feeling is back. Because it's never enough. Just this one time turned into several times. It's the routine worshiper. Here's why. Because what happens is you end up developing a lifestyle around, centered around that outside of the four walls of church. And you come in and you give God all the glory. And I lay down my life. I surrender now. I give you everything for the moment. And then you head out and you do all that you want to do to satisfy your flesh. You outside living your best life. Making all the wrong moves. Choosing all the wrong people. Going through all the wrong doors. Sitting at all the wrong tables. Listening to all the wrong voices. You just flat out wrong. The Samaritan woman's challenge of Jesus was really about her, his greatness. Drink. She says, first off, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. We don't even talk. And don't think you're going to put your nasty lips on my bucket. You don't even have anything to draw with. I mean, that ain't what it said, but I'm just... It says, you have nothing to draw with. And Jesus says, if you knew who I was, as a matter of fact, he says, if you knew who I was in the gift of God, you would ask me and I would give you living water that springs up into everlasting life. She says, oh, so are you better than Jacob who dug this well, whose sons drank, through, drank from it, and who, who has left it for us to also drink from it? Oh, you better than Jacob, huh? She challenged Jesus. I guarantee half of y'all missed that when y'all read that scripture before. But she says, but the Samaritan woman challenges Jesus and his greatness. I need you to understand something. <laughs> Jesus was really trying to get her to a point of, rev of revelation of who he is. But she was too busy uh, uh, honoring and giving glory to Jacob. I want to know what Jacobs are in your life. It was what she really needed because, because, uh, because what he does is he says, hey, uh, if, if, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for what you really need. You see, you see, Jesus always has a way of showing you what you really need. 
He'll, he'll, he'll show you in contrast, in comparison to what you've been using to fulfill that need. And he'll frustrate you with what you really need. He says, you're thirsty and you keep coming back to this well, but if you really knew who I was, you would ask me and I'll give you what you need so you never have to come back to this well. You're not only just here at this well to get water, but you're here at this well because it's in the middle of the day when women don't never come to the well by themselves and nor at this time. So you're dealing with something and you're hiding. How many of you are dealing with something and you're hiding? I'm going to come down your row in a minute because I know that there are others that are even in this room that not just the ones that don't come to church, but I'm talking about even ones that are in this room that are here but hiding. That are hiding in plain sight. She didn't want to be bothered, so she came to the well at 12 noon, the middle of the day. Plain sight. Plain sight. She was expecting no one to be there. He says, Jacob's, Jesus is saying, Jacob's well couldn't even scratch the surface to what you really need. I'm here to let you know today that Jacob's well can't even scratch the surface to what you really need. It, it, it just, it, it, it will never, it will never do because, because she was there. And, and, and what he does is he shows her when she challenges say, saying, oh, are you better than Jacob? And then she says, you know what? Give me that living water so I can just stop coming back to this well. Jesus says, okay, go get your husband. Okay, Jesus, give me water. Sure, go get your husband. Okay, we were just talking about water. Why are you all up in my business? You thirsty, I'm thirsty. You said you have something that's going to help me out. Can you just give me that so I can go? No, 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 no. He's going to give you exactly what you need because oftentimes when God is asking you for something, he's asking you for based on what you really need. And most times we don't know what we really need. This is why the Holy Spirit has to make intercession with groanings that cannot be uttered because you can't even formulate what you need to pray for. He says, he says, go get your husband. She says, I don't have one. He said, you've answered correctly. You, have, you, you don't have one. In fact, you've had, you don't just have one, you've had five. And the one that you're with right now is not your husband. I struggle with this, and I don't know whether this is an accurate uh, indication, but my assumption, because when you look at Scripture and how it, how, it, how, it, how it deals with covenant and husband and wife, when they come together, that, 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 that it, it, it's, it's commensurated and it's, it's brought together by intercourse. And because uh, what he's saying is go get your husband, and then she says, I don't have one. She, he says, you're right, you've had five, so you've been with five different men. And you've never fully, you've given yourself, you've married physically five men. And the one you're with, you haven't done it just yet. I don't, I don't believe he was talking about uh, you walk down the aisle with five different people. He said, you're looking for something, and you think the answer, is, the answer to it is in your ability to give your body to get what you need. But I'm here to let you know today, he says, I'm here to let you know the day that I have what you need, and it's not in the five nor the six. <laughs> he says, there is a spiritual answer. To your spiritual need. But you've been trying to place a physical answer. And use that physical answer. To scratch your spiritual itch. 
And the problem to that is once you scratch that spiritual itch with the physical need, the spiritual itch comes back. And so you keep finding another to scratch that itch. And then that one doesn't work out, it comes back. So you find another to scratch that itch. That does, that, you, you're going through what's called a routine. God said in this season it's time to disrupt every single routine that you started in your life that I didn't initiate. Every routine that you're putting in place of me, I'm going to disrupt it right now. I pray that he disrupts it right now in your life. What are you medicating with that's masking your real need? What are you medicating? What well are you continuing to revisit over and over? God is telling you today it's the wrong place. It's the wrong place. Number two, so that's the routine worshiper. Number two, the next kind of worshiper that we're going to talk about is the religious worshiper. It's the religious Worshiper, Jesus replied to the Samaritan woman, the time is coming when you will not be concerned about where you worship. The place of worship, what he's trying to say is the place of worship is not caught up in your location. And this is where many of us are because we're, we're thinking because we're in this room, we're worshipers. You are in a religious sense. But what, what, what God is really looking for is for you to give your entire life. Your entire life is not summed up in these two hours. But you are, you are walking the part, religious worshiper. You want to look to part. You want to look like you, ah, uh, not my story, I know. You want to look like you, ah. Uh, Glory, glory. Still living any kind of way out there. You singing your heart out, but gifts come without repentance. You're being satisfied even on, in the pulpit and even on the stage by everybody lifting your hands and telling you after church, you just can sing your heart out. Oh, thank you so much. Religious. You won't miss a moment inside of church because you said, I'm not supposed to. The religious worshiper is coming to church, is the one that comes to church because they said they're supposed to. The problem is, that religious approach never produces change. That religious approach has a heart that's detached from it. You're going through the motions. I want to know how many in this room are finding, and you don't have to answer, are finding yourself where I've come down your road, whether you've been uh, considered a routine, whether you're seeing, man, my life kind of uh, uh, resembles this routine worshiper or even this religious worshiper. Because I want to know how many of y'all's life inside of this room is translated to outside of this room. Let me give you an example. The woman brought it up. She says, oh, so... After he says, you've had five and the one that you're with is not your husband, she says, oh, I perceive you are a prophet. Okay, we're, we're headed towards the right direction, but that's still incomplete. But guess what she does? She starts bringing up worship. She says, we say we worship on this mountain. When you Jews say you worship over here. She's bringing up a religious tension. She's bringing up a form of worship that has nothing to do with the struggle that she has. 
the view and the perspective of it has nothing to do with the fact that you're struggling spiritually. But the reality is, and I'm going to confuse y'all, is that it has everything to do with the fact that you're struggling spiritually. Why? Because you're so religious that you're focused on the form. You focus on the form. This is not a place to just show form. Having the form of godliness, but denying the power. What does that mean? That means is that that means this. There's a power when you carry true godliness. There's a power that's revealed. I gave y'all five scriptures and as examples as how he would not allow his glory to be anyone else. But when you become godly, when you carry and really lay down your life and really surrender now as we've been singing, he said it produces power. But not so much the form. The form doesn't produce change. And so the reason, so, so because the form never produces change, you can, stand, you can go every single week to your place on the top of the mountain in the high place to worship and it never produce anything in your life. Or you can come over even over here to where we're worshiping, but if you only do it for form, it will never produce the change that's necessary in your life. But it also tells me this, when you look at it, she's been that one. She's been going to church. She's been going to church. Oh, I perceive you a prophet. Well, we say we worship over here. And y'all say, we, how you know what y'all say? Unless you're going to church. It's, it's, like, it's like the individual, here's that religious worshiper, it's like the individual that when you talk to them and, and you start talking about your church, you ever had somebody say, you know, I need to get back to church. You need to get back to church? Well, what is that going to, what is that going to do for you? Really, you need to get your life right. You need to decide to give God your yes. And when you decide to give God your yes, what it produces is you showing up. What it produces is not only in you showing up inside, but you showing up outside. It produces you being a church. It produces you having a testimony to redeem others out of the pits of hell so that they too can find their church. So she's a religious worshiper. She's a routine worshiper, but the third one, then I'm, and then I'm done, is the revolutionary worshiper. This is the place called now. The religious, uh, the, the religious worshiper comes here out of routine and leaves the same. But the revolutionary worshiper comes here and leaves change every single time. If you keep coming here and doing the same thing and leaving feeling the same way, you're either a routine worshiper or a religious worshiper. But the moment you see power produced in your life outside of these four walls, the moment you see that your taste has changed, that doesn't mean that the things that you desire and you struggle with before you're going to, it's like, man, after I have this one moment, all of that is going to go away. Lord, take the taste out of my mouth. No, it's, it's going to happen. You're going to struggle with it. But the revolutionary worshiper is the one that says, I choose you better. I want you more. Those things were nice and they satisfied me in the moment. But God, I found out that you satisfy me better. Here's the thing that I realized about this woman. If you look at it closely, we always hear this, that she left the well and she left the pot that she brought to the well. Right? But she also left, every, left everything that represented temporary satisfaction. You know why? Because she left with a changed mindset. 
She says, look, I went to this well one way, but I left here having met a man that changed my life forever. Uh, she wasn't worried about the pot. Uh, yes, she'll be thirsty again. Uh, yes, she'll want some water. Uh, yes, she'll want to feel validated. But she'll find over time that God will always validate and scratch every itch that she has. And then she leaves that, that pot, she leaves that well, she leaves everything that represented temporary satisfaction. And she says, I choose him. Then her testimony became, let me tell you about a man. She says, I need to tell you about a man that has changed my life forever. Here's the other thing that I noticed, in, and I'm done. Did you notice? We can deduce that she left the pot. She left the well. She went to tell everybody. But did you also notice that she didn't go focus and telling everybody, oh, he told me here's where I need to worship? You know, he was telling me, we were talking about like, well, you know how we get together every week over there on that mountain and they get together over here. That wasn't even a focus for her anymore. Why? Because Jesus says, a time is coming. And for you, darling, now is. When true worship is not about a place, But the reality is, the real place is now. The real place is produced by change. You can never truly encounter and have a moment with God and he really changes your life and you leave without producing the fruit. We meet here every single week. I try to think about it. Our lives, sometimes we look at, you know, even social media. Even, even when we try to hide, we tell on ourselves by social media, right? And, 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 and by the way, probably 99% of y'all in here, I, I don't follow. And that's, you know, I, intentionally, I just, I'm going to let God deal. <laughs> probably shouldn't have told y'all, like, oh, pastor, don't follow me. Oh, turn up. We outside. <laughs> but your feet should be a whole lot cleaner than it is. Your struggle shouldn't be your struggle. <laughs> Not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'm 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 a date myself, but I believe it was a movie. Uh, I can't remember whether it was Harlem Nights or what it was. But this man, whose woman, uh, another guy has already come and tried to hit on his wife, and the man said, "Every night I gotta prove my love." <laughs> Anybody know what that what movie that was? Temptations of Five Harpies, yeah. Every night, I got to prove, I got to fight for my love. Jesus ain't going to fight with you. He says, you, you'll find out over time. You'll find out in time. You keep going to a place thinking that that's going to satisfy said the place is now there's a place called now everyone stand to your feet there's a place called now that leaves with you I want you to be convicted in your heart when you leave these four walls and you begin to engage and anything that's incongruent with the scripture according and the will of God for your life.
And it's not a bad thing to say that. What I'm saying is, I want him to restore your broken spirit and your contrite heart. Because some of us have scales over it. Some of us have divided hearts. He says, I respond to a broken spirit and contrite heart. So I know you've repented before. Or you said you repented. You said, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm turning. Lord, I'm giving you everything. He said, but this time, I want you to meet me at a place called now. Because at this place... I'm going to change your life forever. Every head bow. Abba, Father. We thank you for meeting us here. We thank you for pouring out your spirit upon us. We thank you for imparting your word and your heart to us. You thought so much of us that you would not only show up, but you would instruct us. Let this moment in your presence produce the change you've been desiring to see in our lives. Father, highlight every moment. Call us out. Tell us, to go get our husband. Go get our issue that we've been struggling with. I promise you we'll respond this time. Thank you, and I pray that you would forgive us and cleanse us for carrying a form of a worshiper, but somehow missing the life of the worshiper. We want to do better. We believe that our lives are being changed in this moment and in this space, and that we are now more aware of who you are and whose we are. We thank you now in Jesus' name.